And it's very good to see you all. We have, um, it's, I'm delighted Hello. to see so many considering Hello. what an exciting okay. time it is um, this today with the, the tennis and the football coming up. Um, I imagine we'll have rather fewer people than normal. I'm going to really go straight into um, our introducing our guest today because we have a real problem with the internet. The problems in Zimbabwe mean that he is likely to lose connection at any time. Um, Dr. Rabson Wariga, who was born in Zimbabwe and studied philosophy and religion there, he holds a PhD in social and political philosophy from the University of KwaZulu-Natal and did postdoctoral research um, at the Northwest University in South Africa, the Institute for the Jewish Community and Research and the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Thought at the Center of Afro-Jewish Studies in the Center of Race Relations in Temple University in the US. He is a founding member of the Great Zimbabwe Synagogue in Mapa Comera in Zimbabwe. I don't know if I, did I pronounce that okay? Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> he is also the president of the Lemba Cultural Association in Zimbabwe. And his book on the sacred times, rituals and customs, the oral traditions of the Lemba Jews of Zimbabwe I really recommend reading. It is quite fascinating, fantastic, um, and, and really has convinced me that we have a community here that should for sure be part of our Jewish community. And it's only, I think, Western hubris and the Ashkenazification of our Jewish practices. Um, although I know he would say it is also basically that we have taken on the white colonial assumption that blacks are inferior and primitive and therefore have no rights as far as we're concerned. I have a feeling we have lost him. We did. We have lost Rabson, so I am really apologize. I do hope he will get on again. As I said, we have this problem. Zimbabwe limits the amount of bandwidth every evening. Okay. When he was on earlier, we also couldn't see him because there's also a limit to the amount of electricity and they rely on solar energy, which does not give very much light. So we saw him in shadow. I hope he will come back and be a little bit of a brighter presence. But if we cannot reach him, he will keep trying. We have recorded an interview with him. But I think we'll start today. I will turn over to Dr. Malka Shabtai, our resident anthropologist and expert on the Jews of Africa, um, uh, and a PowerPoint which she has produced. So I'm going to share my screen um, and... Um, I hope you can see, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Right, yes. okay. Well, it'll come in. Here we are. And so, you're going back to the lemba, yeah? Yes. I shall move it. We'll go straight to the lemba. Here we are. Do you want to? We is this a lemon? We can't, we can't see anything. You can't see anything? No, you might have to come out of screen sharing and back in again. Okay, I am so sorry. Okay. Can you okay. see it now? Right. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So I will start and you will move forward, yes? Yes, yes. Okay? Tell, tell me when to move. Okay. So welcome back, some of you, and welcome the newcomers. Uh, we are starting with a brief uh, visit uh, with the Lemba in Zimbabwe, where I was two, two years ago for Pesach. 
I met Rabson in 2010 in a conference in the US, but was only, uh, it was only possible for me to get back to, Z to go to Zimbabwe uh, two years ago when Rabson invited me to celebrate Pesach with the community. Here you see our first hug after uh, uh, eight years since we first met. And in the background, it's very important. This, this is supposed to be the Lemba Cultural Center. This building is a result of a big donation that they got from the US, but the donors then left. So the building is supposed to host a synagogue, a learning center connected by Wi-Fi, and a clinic. And we'll get back to the issue of circumcision, but the building is now like this with no roof, and they're supposed to host there the annual meetings of all Lemba people in Zimbabwe, South Africa, and the rest of it. Let's move forward. Let's move. Oh, I moved the wrong way. I do apologize. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the symbols of the Lemba, and we'll mention a few of them, is the instrument, the musical instrument, the Kondira. They believe that this instrument is a, a, a souvenir or, or part of the instruments that were in the temple. This is, uh, this is a, a Modric, the leader of the community of Harare. As all Jewish communities, there is also a certain separation between the small community in Harare of city dwellers and the rest of the Lemba who are living in villages, in nine villages throughout Zimbabwe. But when I came, I visited this community and Modric is leading the community uh, in an orthodox Jewish way, uh, which he uh, kept or learned when he visited is in Israel and studied in Yeshiva. Next. Uh, in my visit, I invited Rabbi Eliyahu Birenboim, who is a very important person in the issue of diverse Jewish communities, a very pluralistic Orthodox rabbi, who is also a, a head of the Institute for Jewish Teachers. And he did not know the Lemba before, so he came with me uh, only for five days. So as a rabbi, he could bring a matzot, but usually the Lemba uh, make their own matzot. And we will mention again Sharon, who is uh, next to me uh, in a little while. Uh, uh, this uh, beautiful little girl, her name is Maya, and we will meet her again. Next. Uh, this is not such a great uh, picture for uh, me, but I was climbing the most important monument for the Lemba. This is the Great Zimbabwe Monument, which it is believed that the Lemba built and lived there. They had a kingdom of the Lemba in Great Zimbabwe, which is now a UNESCO monument, until the moment that one of the kings expelled them and then they spread out throughout Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. It's very difficult to climb it, and I could make it because of the hand of Rabbi Birenbaum, who was willing to help me to come up. Okay, next. Uh, this is a very special moment. I don't know how much you see of it, but this is a talk between Rabbi Birenboim and Rabson near the synagogue. And they are discussing what is similar and what is different between Orthodox Judaism and Lemba way. And you will hear Rabson later on, but Birenboim, Rabbi Birenboim told him, you should keep holding to the religion and practices of your forefathers. And from that place, have a dialogue with normative modern Judaism. We will get back to this point because it is very crucial point uh, in Rapson perspective on Jew, uh, uh, different uh, possibilities of being a Jew. Next. I uh, don't know. They seem to have slipped the pictures for some reason. Yeah. I don't know, this, this should be lower. Uh, when I came there, I lived in a village. By the way, I was there with my 15 years old daughter. My daughter taught the children, the choir songs for the Pesach Seder. And I lived in a little room together with my daughter in the house of Daniel, who is the leader of the community. And we actually uh, 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 sp spend the daily life of the community and 
when Shabbat came, things are changing. Next. I hope, okay. Uh, we don't see the faces, unfortunately, but this is Daniel, the head of the village, and he is now teaching me to eat uh, sugar cans. <laughs> Next. And, I and, this, and this is my host mother in the village. That's very interesting to say. Both Daniel and his wife, my mother in the village, uh, worked in the city. He was in the military. She was a nurse in a, in a hospital. But when they retired, they decided to come back to the village. And every woman started the day by uh, working out uh, with the um, tiras, with the corn, because most of their diet is based on corn. Of course, they are cooking outside. The woman here is the leader of the women. Uh, the most amazing things that when you look at them from the outside, just a general picture, you see regular African village people. But when you go with them to the synagogue on Friday and Saturday, you see Jewish people. They pray, they pray some in Hebrew, some in Shona, which is the local language. And Rabson, who is the Shliach Tzibur, is writing and preparing all the Sidurim and prayer books uh, for Shabbat and the holidays uh, so they can understand the meanings and can be part of it. Uh, uh, this is the school in the village. Of course, you can immediately say this, is, this looks like a British school because in, education is very important in Zimbabwe. The school in the village is very, very important. All the children dream on education. Zimbabwe is the most educated country in Africa. There are universities, there are branches, and people from all over Africa come to study in Zimbabwe. And when we visited there, uh, uh, me and my daughter were the first white, peop white people they ever saw. So that was a big event in the school. Uh, this is a nice picture. Uh, 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 Daniel uh, taught me how to wash my clothes without a washing machine and a dryer. <laughs> uh, that's a group of our children in the village, which my daughter work with them most of the time and myself. We taught them songs and dances. And uh, that was interesting uh, insight of my daughter because she worked with children from the US and from other uh, countries she, that she experienced, she said, these children have no accent problems with Hebrew because Shona is very much like Hebrew in its a, a, a pronunciation. So they pick up songs and they gave a performance in Pesach. Everybody was totally uh, shocked. This is this uh, um, Tatenda was our best student. She's learning to read and write in Hebrew. She already knows a lot. Tevel gave her private, my daughter gave her private uh, classes. And she also helped Rabson. She light the candles. She lead some of the prayers. She, we hope that she will become a community leader when we get the opportunity for her to come and learn more. Okay, they use uh, this uh, solar panel. That means that only sometimes we can charge our phones, only sometimes we can watch television, uh, but they live with the solar panels in this remote village. By the way, eight hours drive from the capital, the village called Mapakomere, as uh, Sibyl said uh, pro, uh, rightly, and Rabson, who is living in the university city called Ma Mashingo, is coming uh, for weekends and for holidays to lead spiritually the community. The rest of the week he's teaching and working at the university. Yeah, uh, we teach them to write their names in Hebrew. They are, uh, you know, it was, sometimes it was my dream to teach in Africa under the mango and avocado trees. And this exactly what we were doing, sitting in, under the trees and just everybody want to learn. When we wanted to give them a break, they didn't want to take a break. I was exhausted and my daughter was yelling at me, how can you take a break? You see how much they want to learn? We have to use every minute. I'm saying that because they are dreaming about visitors, volunteers, sisters and brothers from the rest of the Jewish world to come and be part of them and they part of us. Uh, yeah, we were writing, uh, Daniel Go went and brought for us a, a, a 
even the notebooks and the pencils, it was rare to have there, although they have to keep everything in the school. This is the Pesach Seder, because the synagogue is not functioning, so they do Shabbat and other holidays in, a, in the school, in the local schools, there is no electricity, so it was very romantic if you look at it one way, we all in candles, that was our small family, uh, Dr. Abson Uriga, myself and my daughter, uh, the community prepare a, a, a meal, and listen to this, they still do the tradition of um, Akravat uh, uh, Korbanot. They slaughter the sheep in the eve of Pesach in a kosher way, and uh, they, then they make the community meal and eat together and pray together until very late at night, and they all walk there. During Shabbat, they start in the morning and they pray the whole day. During the break, they study Pirkei Avot and Parashat HaShavua. Um, this is one of the women's leader. I brought as a gift to the women, the scarves, which is say uh, Pesach 2018. They all put it on their heads in different ways. And what was amazing for me that they all know all the prayers, both in Hebrew and Shona. And you know, when you look at them, as my daughter said, Judaism is not a question of technology or education or, or anything else or modernity. Judaism is a question of soul, and we should all share the same soul. Our children almost saying goodbye to Tevel and myself uh, before we left. Uh, 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 it was amazing, their enthusiasm, their dreams. A uh, Rabson dream is to create from the school what he called Lembaville College. Rabson want to, to, to improve the education in the village, and we are trying to bring uh, one of the art world organization to this village uh, because the area is considered to be under development project of the, of the state. Uh, Zimbabwe is not an easy state, but this is only one village out, out of nine villages and Rapson is going to uh, hope to do, to make Mapakomere as the center of the Lemba in Zimbabwe and in South Africa. And just to mention, Rapson was formally appointed as the processor of the late Professor Matheva from South Africa, who was the ultimate leader of the Lemba. And by the way, I have his handwriting, which his daughter gave me when I met her in 2010 in the US. So Professor Matheva wrote the whole history of the Lemba and Rabson with his book did a big oral history project. And now he's completing his second book about family laws among the Lemba. And that was almost my goodbye with my father and mother in their home before we left. Uh, yeah, very dear and dedicated people. I wish I could do more for them. I think we will stop sharing at this point. Right. Um, I don't know whether we've managed to get um, He's not back yet, no. Not back yet, okay. So you can use the videos, I think that we will be- We'll have to stop with using the videos, unfortunately. Oh dear, okay. sorry, I don't quite know what's happened here. Um, let me end, end the show. Am I still sharing? No. Or have I stopped? No. You've stopped. No, okay. I'm not, I stopped sharing, good. That was my intention. Um, what I will do is we will move that now to, to the recordings. Um, uh, I have two recordings. Again, I have to warn people that the, the internet connection was, was really was not good. This is, um, I know in Ethiopia they always say, this is Africa. I don't know if that is a saying that you find also in Zimbabwe. But whenever they say this is Africa, it is when something doesn't work, um, when the technology doesn't work. And certainly um, we've had enormous problems because of the internet connection has been poor. But I'll share my screen again and hope that you can understand. Certainly the first one is, I think is fairly clear. Um, the- Sibyl, uh, I just want to add that yeah. it, took, it took five hours 
uh, that to make it possible to interview Robson. And what we got here is out of five hours that we invested in trying to do the interview. Okay. So hello? again, tell me if you can see this. Can you see okay. Malka? So hello, uh, Robson. Dr. Robson, we are from yeah. Good. From Zalemba in Zimbabwe. Uh, I would like to ask you a few questions to help right. our audience to understand a little bit better. Right. Uh, so please give us some brief background. When we speak about the Lemba, where are they? How many are they? Where are you? Yes, uh, Malka, it's very difficult to tell the number because uh, no one uh, ever took uh, some kind of census of uh, the Lemba uh, or where they are living. But in Zimbabwe, they are spread all over the country. You'll find them in the eastern side of the country, bordering with Mozambique, where they, uh, which was part of the entry point into the interior of the southern continent, the southern part of the continent. And in the northern part of the country, you have uh, with the border with uh, Zambia, you have also some of the places where they occupy. But the places where they have very uh, 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 things they do, rituals, traditions, uh, you can get them uh, like in the places in the central part of the country western part of the country and southern part of the of, of Zimbabwe, I mean to say. And also they are found in South Africa, the northern part of South Africa. And some of them, some of them have assimilated. You see, the, this is, uh, it's, uh, we are talking of a group of people who have lived in the southern part of Africa for a long time. And they have assimilated in uh, other places, in other groups. And uh, it's now that they are coming out and indicating that uh, they want to rejoin the group and they want to uh, come back and uh, be part of the, the whole family. So if you talk of the people, they are found in countries like uh, southern part of Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, part of Zambia, the DRC or the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, some parts of Angola, uh, Namibia, and uh, South Africa, as well as Botswana. Great. And so what is the origin of the Lemba, and, what is, and why the story of the Lemba is different than the Ten Lost Tribe legacy? The story of the Lemba uh, comes in as it is handed down to generations from generation to generation whereas we grew up we're told we are israelites we came from the ancient kingdom of israel and um, we lived in uh, yemen for a very long time and uh, we were told our forefathers left yemen and traveled to africa via word our masela and when they were uh, in the middle of the ocean hopefully the Indian Ocean, the ship or the boat in which they were in broke in parts. One group, uh, they said they don't remember where it, it went and the group in which our forefathers were landed in Africa. And uh, as I went on doing research, I discovered that uh, among the uh, B'nai Israel of India, they have the same story of a ship that was broke, uh, or that was, uh, what do you call it, that was wrecked. And uh, it also broke into two parts. Uh, they don't know where the other piece went, and the, the piece that uh, their forefathers were talking about is the piece that is uh, in India, is the, the group of people that is in India. So uh, we are still communicating with the friends in India to find out whether it was the same ship they are talking about, or it's a completely different ship. But the story of the shipwreck uh, is found in those two groups so far, uh, uh, to my knowledge. But what about the tribe so, of Judah? Which kind of, where is your original belonging? We are not yet sure as to say we belong to this tribe, but what I know, 
there is, uh, there's always been uh, uh, the talk of a priestly link, not uh, in the sense of being just a priest, but uh, you remember the after some time later on uh, to the Buffett in France, uh, the British anthropologist who did um, some research among the Lemba and uh, came out uh, with a discovery uh, of the link of um, uh, what can we say, uh, the Guanim uh, gene pattern. And um, that explanation uh, then explained why our forefathers were talking of themselves as priests, um, which is likely for us to believe that um, there's a link between the house of uh, Levi. As for Judah, Reuben, and others, we, we, we don't have the knowledge as yet. We are still looking into that. What kind of Judaism do you practice? If you look into the uh, practices of the Lemba, where is your, what kind of Judaism do you hold and what, where do you believe are the sources? There's a combination yeah. of, of uh, things happening now. Uh, Post-Rabbinic uh, acceptance, uh, acceptance of post-Rabbinic uh, teachings and uh, Uh oh, we have we have a break. Like I hinted earlier on, that uh, the 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 self provision is a little bit of a problem. Okay, let's go on quickly. Uh, so, what did yes. you say about the Jewish practices? Yeah. Yes, I was saying the Jewish practices are both. Uh, pre-rabbinic and also an inclusion of post-rabbinic because of uh, uh, acceptance that uh, there were developments uh, that happened during the Lemba stay in um, in Africa. As you, as it is, it's well, it's, it's, it's well known that um, there were no emissaries that were coming from Israel or Europe or, or anywhere coming to look for Jewish people in the southern part of the continent. And since there were no such people coming to, to communicate of the developments and the changes, unlike it was uh, in the known world or the Mediterranean known world of that time, whereby you had uh, people like uh, Benjamin uh, the traveler from Spain who would travel around looking and trying to find out where Jews are. Like, Unlike that, so in Africa, <coughs> excuse me, in Africa, you have to find out that the discovery was late, very late. You only read about people like Cohen, the, the British uh, imperial uh, representative, who would come in and uh, talk to the king and goes back. And other Jewish people who were involved in the uh, British uh, system by then. And uh, so it it was very difficult for someone in the southern part, in the in the in the, in the bushes there, so that who can actually be understanding that there are no developments in terms of religion, in terms of places where the Jews can be found, and also assimilation was one of the major pressures that the Lemba people faced, and uh, up to this level, up to this time. It's only uh, that we are reviving the spirit of going back to our traditions so that as a starting point for many Lemba people, because uh, one cannot just uh, start from Norway, because they have been practicing Jewish life, having uh, high holidays like uh, Pesach, New Year, uh, the campings of uh, of the, 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 the boots and, and many other tradition, uh, traditional um, rituals like circumcision, which is very central to, to, to Lemba uh, traditions. Um, it was not among many tribes of, of Southern Africa. They came in and they introduced it. Uh, and uh, then uh, it, it became uh, one of the, 
central practices and many, many other rituals which they have been practicing, which are Jewish and um, then was to keep Jewish uh, ministry was to keep the Limba people. Uh, oh, sorry. That's, um, I have a second take here, which, um, because we lost the connection at that point. Can you see the second tape? Yeah. Good. Uh, hi, Rapsom. Uh, let me ask you once again about your right. leadership. About your leadership. What kind of activities you are engaged as a leader of the community in Mapa Comere and for the Lemba in general? Yes, we, my leadership is uh, focused on two things. Uh, we have been uh, fighting very hard to create an institutional uh, framework that will help the Lemba people um, to preserve their culture and heritage at the same time uh, to focus on the possibility of um, retaining to especially the religious aspect to to see that the labor people have uh, gone back to the beliefs and the belief systems of their parents of their forefathers when um, i look at uh, the activities that we are doing now that are very practical first is uh, the meetings that have been taking place uh, as Lemba Cultural Association uh, 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 Okay, I was saying um, that uh, um, for a long time, the Lemba people have been paying attention on the cultural and heritage uh, uh, dimension or domain, as you put it, um, that included sacred times such as Pesach or past in, in Shona, so they call it, for self denial, and uh, also times like, like um, in gathering, celebrating of the first fruit of the harvest, all they were uh, uh, observing. Uh, that was the cultural dimension, and also. Then there is a religious dimension that comes in, not because of um, uh, organizations from the US or anywhere else, but this has been the desire for Lemba people to maintain their culture because their history and their lifestyles. So the religious dimension that has seen many young people in interaction with different uh, Jewish friends worldwide have even led us to the idea of building a synagogue. Not only one, but uh, as a first step of understanding that although our origins um, includes uh, our origins, they include both uh, descent and faith. Uh, on the faith part, it's very different from, uh, that is why earlier on I talked about uh, uh, pre-Rabbinic Judaism and post-Rabbinic Judaism. On the pre-Rabbinic Judaism, as we all know from reading, that there's no separation between religion 
politics, culture, heritage, everything was one thing because that's how the Lemba people have managed to maintain uh, their culture and heritage, to observe uh, sacred times, rituals and customs for all these years. Uh, you are talking about over 3,500 years, people observing all these rituals. It is not out of leisure uh, that uh, uh, rituals like circumcision takes place. Uh, it's only now that it is it has been taken into medical in the medical field as ways of uh, 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 helping people not to be and for I mean to prohibit uh, I mean to stop or to prevent. Uh, sexually transmitted uh, infections. But for the Limba people, it was both cultural and religious. So the combination of origins and practices remains the same uh, among the Limba people. Besides assimilations of during and after colonialism, there was a lot of falsification of uh, Lemba uh, existence, as well as their own cultures and cynicism, of course, developing out of uh, uh, the, the kind of thinking that was found among uh, Europe and uh, other nations that uh, the issue of color, black and white, and all that. But we still believe it is not about color, it is not about political persuasion, it is simply something that is in us. Let me take you for the next stage, which will almost finalize this brief opportunity. So what is your vision? Where the Lemba will be, or would you like you, them to be in 10 years? What are your expectations or dialogue with the State of Israel and the world jury? Where, where should it all go? In the next 10 years, what we are looking at now of Lemba people having returned to Judaism, uh, returning, our return to Judaism is not in the same way many people think, that uh, it's not just uh, you tell a group of people return to Judaism just like in a church and then people rushes and uh, they, they beg their Jews. But there's a lot of looking at issues and problems that um, our understanding of the law uh, that Moses uh, kept or that Moses brought a group of fathers, and the second, the post-rabbinical understanding of the law of Moses that actually, as we all know, 613 laws were brought up, and um, we are also looking at those. But in those 10 years, we are looking at uh, younger people, looking at it critically and creatively in seeing where is it, where it differs between Lemba culture, and the post-rabbinic uh, Jewish laws, one and two. As Lemba people, Israel for us is a heritage. It is our heritage. I'm afraid at this point it 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 descends again into um, uh, in in into rather bad sort of communication, so we have to stop there, that Israel is their heritage. Let me take it from here, yes, okay? please. Thank you very much for your patience to listen to Rabson. Rabson is a very dear, struggling, enthusiastic person, and um, I would like just to add a few things. Uh, so far, we were successful to bring two young people from the Lemba, together with Rabbi Birenboim to study in Israel. And now they are back there and they, each one of them, one woman, one man, uh, teaching and, and working with their communities. 
and they are all together around Rapson. There are two big missions for the Lemba, as Rapson explained to me. One, he must come to Israel, to the concrete place called Israel, uh, to see for his own eyes, to have meetings, discussions, dialogues with diverse people in this country and present the story of the Lemba by himself. That's one thing. And we are working on it, trying to get Rabson to Israel in the very next few months so he can do it through the media, through meetings and conferences, so he can learn by himself what is the state of Israel a, a part in the current life of the Lemba in Zimbabwe. That's one thing. The second one, as he told me, the empty uh, building that you have seen, it has a critical a role in the survival of the Lemba. In order for the young generation to actually be part of, to actually be, belong to the Lemba people throughout Zimbabwe and other places, they need this place. They want to be connected through Wi-Fi, to Wi-Fi, to the rest of the world, to learn, to pray in Hebrew, to meet other young people from all over the world. They want to have the clinic because what happened for the Lemba because of the circumstances of the state of Zimbabwe and the persecution, they decided to make the circumcision not in eight days, but in eight years. So nowadays they still do it in eight years. They take the young children to the bush, they connect for themselves the bar mitzvah and the circumcision, and then they, they come back to the village and they become adult Lemba people. So they want to have the clinic inside the building so they will have the facilities and the privacy to go back to, uh, to circumcision for eight days. And of course, they want to have this gathering place because Professor Mativa used to have in, in Sukkot each year a, a gathering assembly of all Lemba people. And Rapson was tracing uh, Lemba people in uh, Botswana and they have been lost. But once in a while, other people are raising up from different places Recently, they had the general elections of all Lemba people. Rapson has been appointed again as the head of the cultural association. And I would say, knowing other communities in Africa, uh, I would say that Rapson is relatively uh, assertive in the meaning of uh, uh, struggling to first go back to the tradition of their forefathers and then have a dialogue. Uh, they are quite isolated. There are no many visitors. There were a group of people from the US who were connected to the Lemba and due to all kinds of uh, uh, financial and political issues, they caused this organization caused a split within the Lemba in Zimbabwe uh, between the Harare small community and, and, and Rapson. I think that these days it became better because there, there were also a representative from there, but uh, there is much to do. They have a vision, they want to work hard, but they need, they need first support, sense of belonging. And, and uh, Ravson told me that the reason he's writing the books and doing this oral history project is mainly for the young generation. They need to read their history. The book that uh, uh, Sibyl already looked at is very detailed. You get uh, information of how the tradition kept through the generations, how they fight the uh, uh, assimilation and pressure from Christianity and Islam, uh, 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 how uh, the structure of the Lemba is a structure of 12 subgroups inside it, clans, 12 subclans. They have strict, strict laws of uh, dietary laws and of marriage and so on and so on. So- Okay, you know, can I- can I just sort of interrupt you there? Because we have a few questions um, that I'd like to, to, to go on to. It, it, oh, you know, in, in, the abs in the absence of, um, of Rabson, I'd be grateful if you answered the questions, but I would like to ask one first. Well, um, my sense reading Rabson's book is that there is a real danger that the traditions are being lost the danger of an oral tradition, firstly, is because it's oral, is the reason that it hasn't been believed, because no one can trace back how old an oral tradition is. And we're so used to a written uh, tradition 
and we can date our Mishnah and our Talmud. So we know how long the traditions have been going on, but with an oral one, you can't. So that's one problem. But the other problem with an oral tradition is that things get lost. And I know his concern is that a lot of Lemba tradition is being lost because the older generation is dying without passing it on. My concern is by taking Rabson to Israel, you are encouraging an in inclusion and an, uh, an, an importation of rabbinic and modern Judaism, which is going to dilute even more the Lemba traditions. No chance. First of all, nobody take him, he wants to come. Right. Rabson is not a person to be taken, he's a person who is making his own choices. So Rabson want to come. He want to see the land of Israel, the state of Israel with his own critical eyes. That's first. And in, 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 on the side of it, his daily work, his daily efforts is both as a researcher and documentarist of the old traditions by this large oral history project that he did in the first book. And you will see more of it in the family laws and, and all of that in the second book that he's very soon uh, going to complete. And the issue is that he want to translate it to Shona. He wanted to give the, the young generation the opportunity to read it and learn it in their own language. Now, I understand fully Rab's on a project uh, uh, to fight to create the center uh, uh, because the center will be like a school, a training place, a gathering place, a, 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 how do you say, a mate place for young people to meet each other. And, and they do need a physical infrastructure where and on which the, the cultural uh, project will continue. By the way, I am in touch also with people from South Africa, from the Lemba, and some of the leaders from the Lemba in South Africa, and they are all relating to each other. And, uh, and they work together. They used to be very much more together with Professor Matiba. They would call all the Lemba people, younger and old, uh, together in Sukkot every year. And thousands of people would come together for 10, 10 days. Uh, and now they want to renew some of it. And actually, I even believe that when Rabson will come to Israel, he will be more stable in his own agenda and vision. And as he said, I want to mention it. When I talk to Rabson, so what are you going to be finally? Reform, conservative, or orthodox Jews? And he tell me, no, we are not going to be either one of those. Not yet. First, let us come back to the tradition of our forefathers and get to be stronger, clear, and so on. So Rabson is in the state of dialogue. Nobody will impose anything on him, never. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to hand over now to Aviva and Jewish Renaissance, who got, I think, various questions. Um, so, uh, um, Aviva, if you would like to. Thank you. We have Dapo first, so I'm going to add Dapo as a spotlight on the screen. Dapo, will you unmute yourself and then you can ask your questions. Hear me now. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, some uh, people might know me. Um, I, this is very difficult um, because everything that Rapson says, I don't have a problem with. Oh, I should introduce myself. I've been a member of West London for donkey's years. Um, my son had his bar mitzvah there. Is that Angela? Hi. <laughs> um, um, and I was quite um, involved in um, uh, Jewish decor for many years. Um, now, I know also that there's a certain um, reluctance in the African intellectual community to address um, the Jewish community because you just get slammed as anti-Semitic. Even Shurinka, a Nobel Prize winner, made this mild comment, and there was an uproar about anti-Semitic. There was actually nothing anti-Semitic in what he said. It was just um, 
equal criticism of Arabs and Jews. But, uh, so people aren't saying what they think. However, I think it's really dangerous that um, those Jews don't actually realize how vicious the lies they are telling are. Because I think it's not just that it offends Africans, it completely destroys the Jewish perception of what the hell you're doing. You talk about the Jews of Africa as if the rest of Africa had nothing to do with this conversation. I'll give you an example. You talk about the similarities between Shoda and people. Be serious. If you take philology, African languages were prior to Hebrew. So if there's a similarity, it's the other way around. And then you have to think um, the way in which Israel talks about Ethiopia, when ancient Ethiopia was a flourishing civilization before Israel was founded. And they, they actually took somebody to the Houses of Parliament. I was there. And they got this girl to say her community was so primitive, they didn't have mirrors. Now, okay, you can think this is fun. Just think how the rest of Africa thinks. When you get a black girl to say in parliament that she comes from a community so primitive they never had mirrors, you're building up hatred. If you then take, look at the way Spielberg behaved. Um, he did Schindler's List. He, he was told that in a community in California, when there was a horrified shooting scene, the black kids burst out laughing. He thought this was anti-Semitism. So he flew there, witnessed it, then spoke to the kids and discovered they were, their lives were so brutalized that when they saw someone being shot on screen, they burst out laughing. So he came back and said, nothing to worry about. It's not anti-Semitism. Think about that. Nothing to worry. They just brutalized kids. Nothing to worry about. So you look at African history. And you look at the way that Israel completely distorts it. I've been to the Israel Museum. I think most of the people would know what Armageddon is. Israel Museum calls it a draw. Now, if Armageddon is a draw, I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what a failure is. So you've got this massive distortion. And then you're talking about Zimbabwe. Israel sent serving military officers to Rhodesia to kill Africans. European countries didn't. That's how bad Israel's position was. It sent serving military officers to Rhodesia and they went around killing Africans. Dapo, Dapo, can I just come in here? Yeah. Um, I, I think this is the first of the events that we've been holding that you've come to. Is that right? That's correct. Right. Can I just explain what the program has been about? We started by looking at the Bush report, which was very much aimed at organ looking at the racial integ integration within Judaism. Um, oh, let me stop my video so you can see me. Sure. Okay, so we were looking at that very much with the idea as to how we can change our narrative as far as black Jews are in this country. Since then, we have looked at two communities in Ethiopia. Next week, we will be looking at the Igbo in Nigeria and we'll conclude with the Abayudaya in um, Uganda. The whole purpose is to show, firstly, that we cannot speak about Africa as Africa, that it is a diverse continent with many, many different communities and with many, many different Jewish communities there. So our under, what we are trying to do is to change perception, not to look at what Israel, the state may have done in the past, but how we can change people's understanding of the ancient Jewish civilizations of which there are many that exist in the African continent, and of the many new Jewish communities that are emerging on the African continent. I'm entirely in agreement with you. Sorry? I'm entirely in agreement with you. Exactly. But so be that precise. is our purpose. That Look, is the purpose yes, of- Yes, I agree. I know exactly your purpose and I support it or else I wouldn't actually come on board. 
but I'm asking you, go back to her opening words where she said, Zimbabwe was the most educated. She was the first white person there. This is playing a trope. No, I oh. did not say that. I say I am the first uh, in the school. My daughter was the first white child that these children from the school visited. I also said that there were Americans from the Holashon and, uh, and Kulanu organizations that visited and worked with these communities and there became a dispute that split the community to two. And more than anything else, what we do in this series, we in many great efforts, we invite leaders from the different communities uh, to come along and speak for themselves because I visited and I'm in personal connections and work with these communities, I am facilitating the opportunity. Now, the state of Israel is one issue. The relationships with, of mine and many other people in Israel with the leaders of these communities is on a family, personal, volunteer basis. So this is where we are. We want to give the opportunity for them to speak for themselves. By the way, let me just tell you that the uh, ANU, the uh, Jewish Museum, agreed finally uh, uh, two years ago or a year ago when they started the new exhibition to uh, invite a representative from all diverse communities in Africa and Latin America and Asia to present themselves and be part of the exhibition. So many things are happening and it is not right or good to see them in one way. We are trying our best on this platform. I understand, Malcolm. You actually have to listen a little. I'll stop in a second. Just a, yes, we do must need try to and on, listen sorry. to what I was saying. I say, I said I had no problems with what Rapson said. I said the way you are framing this is something that most Africans will not tell you. It's offensive. And that's why I had to try and drag it. That it's not obvious to sorry. you that it's offensive. And you're saying, oh, I didn't say anything offensive. I'm trying to get that across. He's right. Uh, Cyril, you are on mute. We cannot. Yeah, I think what we'll do is, I, I, I think that there's actually a really important conversation being had here. And I think it's quite a complicated conversation. Um, I'm also aware that we've got a very, very little time left. And we do also have some other questions. Um, what I think that I'm going to do is, or I'm going to suggest we do, because I think this is a much bigger discussion that we can then we can possibly have right now what i'm going to do is hold it for a moment let's bring edgar in to ask his and a couple more questions and i think at the end what we should do is we should give maybe dapo as well as sibla malka a final kind of moment to sum up where they're at and where they stand and also maybe hold this in mind as we go on to the next two or three um sessions that we've got because actually what we have underneath here is kind of a debate about who tells the stories of Africa and African jury and I think that's actually a massive massive debate to have um, but maybe it's not actually thematically what we were going to do so I don't want to negate it I'm going to let Edgar ask his question and take any others then we'll bring Dapo, Mark and Sybil back in to kind of sum up where they are with this and maybe we'll keep that in mind as we go on to the next couple of sessions over the next couple of weeks because I think it is really important to have these voices it's also really important to make sure that everything we're saying is accurate and speaks to the narratives that we want to have so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring Edgar in um, if you're there Edgar can I ask you to ask your question well, I find it very difficult to follow on that uh, emotional discussion. Uh, and I am also disturbed because although I could see and hear how um, Depo felt, I couldn't understand him all that well. The, 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 the connection wasn't that clear. Um, well, any, anyway, uh, as I say, I find it difficult to continue now, but what I was wondering about was uh, what communication, what connection there is between the Lemba 
and the uh, Jewish communities of European origin around Southern Africa. Oh, that, yeah, fair enough, that's it. Okay, very brief, I will answer this question. Uh, when I visited Zimbabwe, I also visited the Ashkenazi synagogue and the Sephardic synagogues in Harare. And uh, what I found, two beautiful large buildings with very few people who remain there. And when I asked them about the Lemba, they told me that so far the Lemba were not allowed to enter these synagogues. And I can just share with you my experience. Uh, I talked with uh, the, the security person that happened to be an Israeli and I said, uh, I would like to invite uh, some of my Lemba friends uh, to visit this synagogue, is that okay? He said, yeah, they are welcome. They came and visited. And then what happened, the next stage was when uh, the appointed Israeli ambassador came to Harare, uh, I asked that he will meet uh, my Lemba friends and he of course agreed. And for the first time, um, the Israeli ambassador met uh, the group of Lemba people. Uh, there was not much developed since then because of uh, all kinds of uh, uh, sensitivities that uh, not allow Israel to open an embassy in Zimbabwe so far. But I can tell you that generally speaking, uh, uh, principally speaking, the Lemba were not welcome, not in the Ashkenazi, not in the Sephardic synagogue so far. That I can tell you. But what about in South Africa? Uh, in South Africa, some new things happen because there is a leading person called, his name is Oded. Uh, and he told me that there are steps of acceptance, beginning steps of acceptance uh, uh, in relationship with several rabbis in South Africa. And I know that Oded is also planning to come to Israel. This is what he told me. Uh, and they, uh, but I cannot tell more, more detail than that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Edgar. And thank you, Malka. Um, what I'm going to do, I think, is Dapo um, mentioned earlier that um, he recognised Angela from West London. Um, and I know that what he said has echoed some of her concerns, not just today, but throughout the series of we've been going on, because there have been questions she's raised that I think have addressed some of his concerns. And I'm going to what I'm going to do is just to finish off before I hand over to Mal Karanta Sybil to finish off for the session and take us forward. I'm going to bring Dapo back alongside Angela, maybe to contextualise some of this and kind of put it in a framework and kind of say what you think it is that we, as people from the UK, who are really invested in this debate and discussion, need to think about in terms of how we frame our contributions. So let me do that. Let me bring Angela up. And I'm going to bring Dapo alongside her. <laughs> Angela, can you start? Yes, hi. First of all, hi, Dapo. And hi. It's wonderful to see you and do give my regards to Summa Day, won't you? <laughs> it's been such a long time since I saw that sweet boy. So, um, I, I, I is absolutely right. I think there is a whole question of who tells the story and Sometimes there is um, what I call neo, a form of neo-colonialism, which is someone else comes and tells your, you know, your story for you. And you know, you know, for centuries, women have been feeling that men have been telling their stories for them. And I think there is there is a power differential, and there's a political power differential, and there's a, a kind of intellectual power differential in terms of who holds the narrative. And I think you're. It, it's very, very tricky because it, it, it's when when a when a, a a people when a community just as an individual has has been disempowered and their voice needs to be heard. It is it's, that's precisely what they can't do is get their voice heard. And sometimes it it needs someone who has the quote power to start that voice to be heard. But there is a real danger 
that that voice gets drowned by the person, the outsider, so to speak, who's telling that who's telling that story. I don't know if that's what you're thinking, Dapo, but it's certainly what what I'm I'm aware of. <clears throat> and and Sybil was right to say this is a, really a context about the British scene, and the Lion Project and Jewish Renaissance have decided to take it, you know, to broaden it out and to go as it were back to you know the big Africa. But I think it remains an an issue about who who holds the microphone or who holds the pen or, or who sits at the typewriter or who you know who rolls the film um, because the telling of the story, the teller of the story affects the telling of the story. Is that making sense to you, Dapo? No, absolutely. It, it's um, it, it, it's it's very difficult. It's very painful um, because I I think the vast majority of people do not have any idea of the scale of yeah. oppression that an African academic has. So we don't have a lot of scholars, and those that we do have are totally terrified. Yeah. Most of them in the U.S. and you know, forget about um, the state 1619 lady. Um, an African you know, denied tenure wouldn't make the small print in the New York Times. So you do not get a lot of serious criticism, and even in the U.K. I mean, I've been known. At Cambridge University, where I grew up, you know, but it's really hard to say certain things. So I get upset when inadvertently, I would say, on the good days and sometimes deliberately, the Jewish story is piggybacking on what Andrew would call the neocolonialism. And it's sort of saying, well, this is a conventional view. Let's put a sympathetic view of Jewish Africa on top of that. And why are you offended? <laughs> Whereas actually you're now putting a sweet on top of poison and saying, look, the sweet is nice. And I'm saying that there's poison underneath. You're denuding Africa. And you know, the question, and it's if it had been the other way around, a Jewish intellectual will say, what is African, what is Jewish about these people? Is it they're Jewish genetically? Well, are they not African? Is it they're Jewish culturally? Are they not African? Because if you, are you dissociating these people from Africa? And then if you go historically, you're going to have some serious problems. Yeah. So none of these are concerns because you don't have the African intellectual to dare challenge you. They lose their job. So I think that's incredibly, incredibly important to say because the last thing we want to be doing um, is a kind of cherry picking neocolonial tourism. Um, what we were hoping to do, and I'm going to bring Sybil and Malka in in a moment to kind of sum up what their intention is, um, because although I'm holding this actually very much, it's their session. What we were hoping to do was have Rabson's voice and have this be Rabson telling his story. But unfortunately, the electricity in Zimbabwe was not our friend and didn't help us with that. Um, but I, I do think the kind of that's a question about today's session, which is whose voice is heard. But maybe it's something we need to think about as we go on through the rest of the series as well. <laughs> To what extent these are Jewish stories and to what extent these are African stories and I think it's really important that you've brought that up so I'm going to say a big thank you to DAPO and hope that we continue to have those conversations a thank you to Angela too and I'm going to bring Sybil in with Malka to finish it off and kind of bring us back to the Lemba community in particular so thank you very um, much. I'd like to say, Dapo, do come next week. We have um, uh, Dr. Remy Iloma, who is from the Igbo community, who would absolutely agree with everything that you said, um, in that the Igbo are very strongly an African Hebrew nation. 
um, and he will be explaining that and why it is that they see themselves very much as that, that they are part of Africa. It is unfortunate that you did not hear Rabson as we had hoped you would, because he would have been leading this discussion had we been able to have a good internet connection. Sadly, that wasn't possible today, but we won't have that problem next week. We should not have it the week after. We are very, very much trying to make this African-led. We are very aware of this whole problem of cultural appropriation and, I suppose, white colonial African tourism. But it is very much a start of something new. Um, I would like um, uh, Malka, please, to, to summarize now on the Lemba. And then um, we will finish off and hope to see you next week. OK. So let me say two sentences before, both to Dapo and Angela. You know, the time is very short, and you are new to the, this kind of uh, sessions. But we are talking about creating opportunities to let community leaders tell their story. That's a very hard work. There are no many places, no many platforms to, 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 to let it happen. This is one, but there are others that we are doing. Now, the other thing is that every work that I am doing with diverse communities for the last 10 years is based on dialogue, based on exchange. I'm doing everything all together voluntarily. My colleagues in the different communities are communicating and working with me uh, uh, based on their needs their perceptions and their leadership. If you were with us last week, you could hear the leaders of the Beta Israel community in Ethiopia. That will be the next uh, other opportunity uh, uh, sessions. And each community has its own concepts, its own uh, visions and its own needs. And that's what we are trying to share here. The big discussions are everywhere. We know them, we are part of them, both as academics and as volunteers and so on and so on. Uh, just to sum up, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Rabson is not here, but uh, Rabson is writing books. Rabson is participating in all different uh, meetings and conferences. And there is a World uh, uh, Association on Judaism in Africa in which it, it, they take place every two years in Africa and one is not in Africa. And all uh, and leaders of the community and researchers from the communities are there. We are all very much aware of it. We are doing our best to create different dialogues. And the Lemba story is, a, is a lucky because they have Rapson. And for the Beta Israel, we are trying to write a collaborative book that two thirds of the book is written by people from the community, whether they are scholars or not. So that's the issue of collaborating, of creating opportunities of coming, uh, of Rapson wish to come to Israel to speak for himself. And, and, and that's the work we are doing now. And I hope that uh, the opening and uh, the op opportunities that we can all create together will make a difference in our life and in the life of the people that we feel are part of our family. Good night. Thank you, Malka. I just want to share my stream, screen for one more minute just to show you um, Rabson's book. Uh, let's see, slide show. Um, current slide. Can you see? Just wait. It's not. It's not sharing. It's not sharing. Okay. Let me try again. Right. Can now? Can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay. So here you are. Okay. Of of sacred times, rituals, and customs oral traditions of the Lemba Jews of Zimbabwe. Um, I do recommend it. Um, I, I challenge anyone to read it and not be convinced that this is a more authentic community than our Ashkenazi European Jewish community. So with that, I'll say good night. I look forward to seeing you next week.